better pack them up, boys. Let's hold our Bibles up. Say, this is my Bible. It is a word of God from God to me. And I will receive it that way. Praise the Lord. Let's uh, turn to Hebrews. And while we're turning there, does anybody know in a marriage relationship who's supposed to brew the coffee in the morning? No. It's called Hebrews. All right, here we go. I'm coming, I'm coming your way. Now I can get with everybody. Of course, I've closed my Bible in the meantime, but I can't believe that you actually said my wife after I just said turn to Hebrews. Of course, at my house, Pastor Kathleen gets the coffee pot ready, but I brew it. That's just because I'm the first one up. So, um, Hebrews chapter 3. I realize I didn't tell you which chapter. We're going to only look at one verse in chapter 3, and then we're going to go to chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Who remembers what I talked about last Sunday? Wow. <laughs> that was kind of a loaded question because I vaguely talked about Melchizedek and the, the relationship. And, I, and I, we're going to go a little bit deeper into that tonight. But first, the first verse of chapter 3 says, Therefore, Holy brethren, let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for the opportunity that you give us first to be your kids, for your, for your son Jesus who died for us and uh, gave us not only life uh, eternally, but life abundantly right here, Father. We thank you for that. Father, I, I thank you for precise words that will fall on spirit-anointed ears tonight and that, Father, that they will bring forth your word in the fashion that you gave it. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let me ask you a question. Another loaded question. Here we go. <clears throat> Is there a certain way you're supposed to pray? Is there a certain way you're supposed to look when you pray? You find out if, if you look around, I don't close my eyes because the Bible says pray watching. And so I pray watching. One time I laid hands on a little girl that got healed of leukemia who was had her hair was dying and, and she was really, really sick. And when I laid hands on her, I closed my eyes and I, I spoke to her body. And when I opened my eyes, she's fast asleep and her hair had returned to the natural color. And I thought, man, I missed it. And I'm never going to miss it again. So I always pray watching. Therefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about tonight, what I just said. So that was a, a, a free side note. Partakers of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. Now, he's talking to, uh, and, and I read the reason I read this is because Hebrews is set up to, and, and it was written to, who? Each letter was called what, whoever it was written to. So it was written to the Jews. It was written to the Hebrews. And uh, what, he, what he was talking about here is that, number one, and a lot of times we sing songs that we get in a position that it says lift up holy hands and we, we're trying to think of everything we might have done that keeps our hands from being holy. And the fact is, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've got holy hands. That's what the Bible tells us. And that's what Paul says right here. He says, holy brother. If they've, the Hebrews that had accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior were holy brother. 
because uh, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, then we realize that it doesn't matter what I did this afternoon or 10 years ago, it's under the blood of Jesus, which doesn't give me the right to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it and just live, uh, live like hell and still go to heaven. Let's just put it that way. But I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to uh, be striving to become more righteous all the time. That's what the Bible teaches. God says, I am holy, uh, be holy. But it's not my holiness that makes me holy or holy brethren or have holy hands. It's the blood of Jesus that does that. So we've got to get out of the thinking that I can be I'm supposed to be perfect. If you've made it perfect yet, let me know so that I can make sure I find the shortcut or else I can pray for liars. Because the only one that I know that was perfect, his name was Jesus. But I strive to be perfect every day. I strive to be more perfect, more like Jesus every day. And that's what we want to do. But... We're going to consider exactly what he said. Consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Let's read one more verse, and then we're going to go over to the, uh, the seventh chapter. Who was faithful to him who appointed him, as, as Moses was faithful in all his house. Now remember, those are all capital H's, so they're talking about God the Father and God the Son. In both places. So Jesus was faithful to God who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful to God in his house. Turn over to chapter 7. <clears throat> I want to talk about Jesus. And you're going to see, I, I made a reference on Sunday um, for those of you who were here. And if you weren't, listen to, uh, listen to it on the internet. If you're watching by internet, make sure you get on. Uh, SilveradoCowboyChurch.org and l listen to Sunday. Uh, let's go on to verse 7. I talked about Melchizedek, and, and, and this is a f some of the foundation of where the information came from that Melchizedek was without genealogy and who he actually represented. But we're going to go through the whole chapter because what we're going to find out, we're going to talk about the high priest and the apostle uh, that we have in Christ Jesus. For this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first. So, and, and there's several references here to the tithe and to the tenth. Don't get caught up in in uh, in the tithe. And I and I've talked about this in the past. We're not going to spend any time on this tonight. Um, in the New Testament, how much of it belongs to God? Somebody say that louder. All of it belongs to God. Luke 6.38 says, Give and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So you can't outgive God. Don't get caught up in, in the tenth um, and, and being the, the tithe, it just being the tithe. Uh, there's some people that count even down to the penny what the tenth is, and they make sure they pay their tithe that way. And here's what I'm going to ask you. What measure do you want God to bless you? I don't know about y'all, but I want God to bless me big. Because if he blesses me big, then I've got more to spread the gospel with. I've got more to share with the kingdom. And I've got more to have the things that I want, want need, and desire. Uh, I can have a new fishing boat. I can, uh, you know, and. I, I just, this is a, a, a another quick side note. I looked at that song we sang, you know, that had the water on there that Kathleen made the reference to about uh, if, it, if that was our backyard, we could go fishing all the time. I noticed that the words were so light 
that the water was distracting. So don't let your, uh, yeah, see. Well, that part wasn't, but when you get to the next part, the, the letters were too light and it was hard to, hard to read it. Don't let anything distract you from where we're going and what the Lord wants to do. So <clears throat> anyway, that was, which doesn't mean don't fish. Don't anybody tell Donald he's not supposed to fish because as far as I'm concerned, I'm excited when Donald gets to go fishing six Sundays a year. Um, because he enjoys it very much. Besides, I heard a testimony about uh, somebody he's been a witness to this week. And past that, we're going to go on. To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated kingdom of righteousness, then also king of Salem. So uh, Melchizedek was translated how? kingdom of righteousness. So if we look at that and we see that he was a uh, translator or king of righteousness, who was a king of righteousness? Remember I told you that Melchizedek was a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ Sunday. It, and, and here's where it comes from. Without father without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like, what? The Son of God. So remember I said he was a type and a shadow of Jesus. Remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. See, what Abraham gave was a tenth of everything that he had taken from all of the kings that, that uh, he had been blessed with. Mel he comes back, Melchizedek blesses him because he went and he, he did what God told him to do. There's something that we, we have to take from that place and we realize that when I do what God tells me to do, however he tells me to do it, then there's a blessing that comes with that, and it's a blessing of, because I, I was obedient. My righteousness doesn't come from obedience. My righteousness comes from the blood of Jesus, but obedience brings the blessing of God in my life. So when I'm obedient with what? With my finances, that brings a blessing. When I'm obedient, when he tells me to go somewhere and do something, that brings a blessing because I'm obedient. When I, I, I look at the, the uh, you know, and there's some examples. There's people that help with the arena uh, when we've got work to do on it. Um, and they're blessed back with, and it takes time. What, what happens? They get blessed back in time with other things that they're doing. God makes their hands more fruitful. What's that? That's a blessing. That's a return on their sowing in that place. Our worship team, um, not only do they enjoy uh, their, their worship time, but they also get blessed back with, they put a lot of time in getting ready. What happens? They get blessed back with, and, and it, may, it, it doesn't mean that their time multiplies. It means that their time becomes more fruitful in everything they do. And so everything that we look at, we look at exactly what happens. So when we look at what, happen with Abraham in how he gave Melchizedek, which was the representation of Jesus Christ. See, there's never a time that Melchizedek ended. As far as, as, far as we're concerned, Melchizedek still exists in God's eyes because there was no beginning and no end. So that tells me that what Abraham literally did was he gave to God. His self. Um, so, because there's without father, mother, genealogy, or having beginning of days or end of life, but made like the Son of God, that does away with you. Remember Sunday I made a reference to uh, uh, there is a, a theology, uh, and, and it's taught in some theological schools and some seminaries. Um, that Melchizedek really was, uh, was Seth. Or, uh, you know, it's projected that he was Seth. 
you know, the Bible says he had be, no, no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. And so that did away with that, that kind of theology. Um, always take what the Bible says. Look at what the Bible says at face value and just apply it. To, I don't have to try to figure out what it means. I don't have to try to figure out because it tells you what it means as you go through it. And it goes on and it says, uh, verse 5, And indeed those who are of the sons of Levi, now I want you to listen to this. This is really important. Remember how where we started? We're talking about the apostle and high priest of our faith, Jesus Christ. We're not just talking about Melchizedek. We're kind of laying a foundation at, at uh where, who Jesus is and how uh, his priesthood as, as our high priest, how it affects us. This is what I want you to look at tonight is how, what does God want us to do? I was going to actually talk about something tonight. I was going to ask you some questions. And this is some of the things I want you to consider with where we're going. What is your part and what do you have a vision for in outreach? Because we're called, I looked at her and she's grinning, so that means she's already got an idea. Um, but what, what we have to do is realize that God's called each and every one of us to some kind of outreach. What, does it, what is outreach? Don't everybody talk at once. Paula? Paula? Okay, a reaching out to a need of something. A witness. Everything we do, whether it's reaching out to a need, whether it's financial or, or physical or whatever it might be, um, should be a witness. Because we're supposed to be a light to a world. It says that we're, we're the fragrance of God among the dying and the living. Dying simply means die, dead spiritually, those that don't know Jesus as their Savior. So it doesn't matter if it's that kind of, of, of reaching out or, or being a witness. Everything that we do, I had a conversation today with, uh, actually uh, pulled into a place that I, I got to sit for quite a long time with uh, one of our bullfighters that gives his time, and, and we talked about some things. And, uh, and where we're going, and, and I shared this just, Real briefly, during uh, why we're, we ha we haven't set a date yet, is because we're going to do a a different uh, kind of outreach, um, and, and we're going to draw more people in by doing this different kind of bull riding outreach. And the thing that we realize is it's still what an outreach, because that's what we're about. Not not our church, but what we as Christians have to be about. We have to be about everything I do should be, not because I'm the pastor, but because I'm a Christian, should be about reaching a world that's going to hell, period. That should be our main focus, no matter if we're at work, if we're at our business, if we're at the grocery store, if we're sitting, I was sitting at the muffler shop today. When I was sitting at the muffler shop, uh, you know, what was I doing? You yeah, man, I talked to... And not because I'm a pastor, and, 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 and actually they recognized who I was, and that's why they talked to me about it, but they should recognize who we are, whether we're the pastor or we're a member of the body. Always remember. I, I believe that uh, um, I did as much. I used to be in the, the real estate business, even though I was, I was a pastor at that time. Um, and everybody I came in contact with, even though they were a customer, they were, a, they were somebody I could witness to somehow in, in, the, in the way that I did business or whatever it was, I, I, I was able to be a witness to them. And, you know, and that's what we have to remember is, is to, to do that. Um, now, consider, uh, let's see. 
Okay, let's go back to verse 5 because I didn't finish that. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who receive the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. And what did that just say? What that said was, who, who, who's the lesser between, you know, in this case, he's using Melchizedek as an example, but who was Melchizedek? No, Abraham was blessed. He was the lesser. And Mel, okay, that's what you're saying. Okay, and, Me, and, and Melchizedek, or God, was the greater. So what am I doing? Am I giving my offerings and tithes to man, or am I giving them to God? Sometimes we get the attitude that what we're doing is we're paying the bills at the church. Well, you know that happens. Some of the tithes and offerings go towards paying the bills at church, but what they, they ultimately go to is they go to outreach and they go to what, because that's what everything's about anyway. So who are you giving it to? Are you giving it to the church? Or are you giving it to God? We're giving it to God. Um, when, when we do, when we give offerings and in, in, out, out from whether it's the church, the ministry, or whatever it is, we're giving it to God. We're not giving it to people or ministries. We're giving it to God in that place because God's the one that brings the blessing. And that's what we have to remember. What that's when this says that who's, the lesser is blessed by the better, then it's God because our attitude is towards God. That's exactly what Abraham did. And that's what this, this, these two verses we're talking about is everybody from Israel kept giving to the Levi's because that's what God said to do. But the Levi's were the representation of the church because they were, of the, tri they were the tribe that was set out to be priests. But see, this is, this is what this is, is talking about. So let's go on. Is we stop that kind of thinking about the priest in the tribe of Levites and get into the thinking of who we are and, who, and what we're doing as a body. Not as a, not as a church building, but as the church. And because each one of us is the church. Uh, now beyond uh, verse 8, here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is a witness that he lives. Even Levi who receives tithes paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, under it the people received the law, that further need, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek? Jesus arose according to the order of Melchizedek. Why? The order of Melchizedek means that there was no beginning, there was no end, there's no genealogy. See, they can't, uh, there's still people today uh, in the world that believe that Jesus was the son of Joseph, not the son of God. And the Bible is very clear about that. He was the son of God, even though he came through Mary, who, who was his, his mother. He was, a, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so when it says that he came from the order of Melchizedek, then it's because there was no beginning, no end, no genealogy, no father, no mother. The father was the father God. And so we realize, and, and, and it even tells us in John uh, chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1, it tells us that before he was here, he was there, and everything that was created was created by him. So we know there really was no beginning and no end, even though the, the man... 
that came to earth, there was a beginning. But in the Son of God, there was no beginning and no end uh, in that. Okay. What further need was there for another priest that should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not called according to the order of Aaron? He wasn't a priest. See, Aaron was the father of the Levitical tribe of priests. So Jesus didn't come as a priest uh, like Aaron did through that lineage, but instead he came by the order of God. And that's, exa that's exactly what this is, what that all just said in, in a nutshell. For the priest being changed, charged, excuse me, for the priesthood being changed of necessity, there was also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which there is no man who is officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, which is the tribe of Moses, spoke nothing uh, concerning the priesthood. There was nothing. See, Jesus was, w w rose out of the tribe of Judah. David was out of the tribe of Judah. Uh, and, and the tribe of Judah was not priests. And that's what this is saying. There was no priesthood spoken of by Moses to come out of the tribe of Judah. And yet, and it is yet far more evident if the likeness of Melchizedek that there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of the fleshly command, but according to the power of endless life. Jesus didn't come out of fleshly law. Jesus didn't come out of law that was given by the priest or given by Moses. Jesus came by the law of endless life, by the power of the law of endless life. When, you looked at, when I looked up that word power, it talked about deutimus, which you come, is a power from the Holy Spirit. We realize that Jesus not only rose from the power of the Holy Spirit, he was anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, he moved by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember this, where we started. Hebrews 3.1 said, Let us consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. So what is our confession? I belong to Jesus Christ. I made him my Lord and Savior. He is my high priest. Peter says we're kings and priests. So I realize, and, and what, so what this is telling us is we've got an example of the Lord Jesus Christ being a, the high priest so that we can be priests under him to accomplish the outreach in this world. So you see where we're going with how, how is outreach going to work. I believe this, the greatest outreach that you're going to have is not connected with what we do as a body for outreach, but it's what you do on a personal level daily with everybody that you come in contact with. So don't, uh, don't hide in your house and uh, say, I, you know, I don't want to do anything. Because God is giving you uh, a directive to follow the order that Jesus set out. What did he do? Jesus was among the people. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to be among the people. And we have an opportunity to be among the people from time to time. Uh, in different different capacities. For it, verse fourteen. For it is evident that our Lord rose from Judah, of which no, I already read that. Uh, here we go, sixteen. Who has come not according to the law of the fleshly command, but according to the power of the endless life? For he testifies, "You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who had no beginning and no end, so that was endless life, the power of endless life." For on the one hand, there is a nulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and its unprofitableness. What was the former commandment? Somebody say the law. The former commandment was that I had to set up uh, sacrifices and I had to do this and I had to do that. And I had to find me a scapegoat 
You know, that's where we get the term scapegoat. You know, you always want to find a scapegoat, somebody, in other words, somebody to blame it on. Because that was all part of the, that, that all came from the old law where they laid their hands on a, a goat, they confessed all their sins, and then they turned a goat loose in the wilderness, and he ran off someplace and was never seen again and died somewhere uh, when, uh, when he ran out of leaves to eat in the desert. Um, so we realize that we don't ha that was a, a powerless law. It was weak, weak and unprofitable is what uh, the writer of Hebrews uh, said. And, and, and it's projected that uh, there's no, there was no writer signature on the book, uh, but it's projected that it was Paul was the writer simply from the style of writing that it was. It matched all the other uh, letters and things and, and the words that were used. But uh, actually none of that matters because the Holy Spirit is the writer. And we realize that, that because it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for. So we realize that it was uh, the Holy Spirit that gave it no matter who actually wrote it down. Verse 19, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is a bringing of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath. All of the Levites on the, uh, the, the, the tribe of Levi that were priests, they were born into priesthood. They never took an oath. Jesus was given an oath by God that he would be, we read it right here, we're going to read it again, that he would be a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That actually comes from uh, Psalm uh, 110 verse 4 is, is what the, the writer here is quoting in both places. Um, for the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, bringing of in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. See, that's the difference between what the law did and what accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior does. I don't accept Jesus so I can go to heaven after this life is all over. I accept Jesus. That's the, that's the byproduct. I get to go to heaven because and live with Jesus because I accepted Jesus as my Savior. But I accept Jesus as my Savior so I can draw near to God. We're supposed to be drawn nearer and nearer to God in, in, in that place. So um, we see exactly what had happened. What did Jesus do? What did, let's consider our high priest and apostle uh, of our confession. What did he do? He said, I don't do any, I don't talk, speak of things that I, that I want or what I think, but I speak of things that my father says. So what did he do? He, drew, he, he was near to his father. He was near to God the Father. It was a, a perfect example. Now, it, it says that uh, in, in, a, in another place in, in Hebrews, as well as in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, the 21st verse, it tells us that Jesus was subject to all the same temptations as we are. He was a man subject to all the same temptations we are, yet without sin. So that means he had the same temptations of getting his focus off of what God wanted to do and getting his focus on what his flesh wanted to do. And so that's an example of uh, to us that if I consider my apostle and high priest that my high, my high priest, what he did, and the reason he was effective the way he was is because he drew nearer and nearer to his father and put his flesh aside, put his flesh down in that place. Inasmuch as he, uh, let's see, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, in other words, Jesus, by what God the Father said to, to Jesus, the Lord has sworn not to relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Again, that he's quoting uh, Psalm 110 verse 4. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So what happened through Jesus? 
by the order of the priesthood that has no beginning and no end. See, forget the name Melchizedek. All Melchizedek uh, actually represents is the priesthood that has no beginning and no end and is forever. So I can get, get in that thinking. You and I have been called by a priesthood into the priesthood that has no beginning and no end. It'll never end and it gives us a responsibility to be able to do that. What happens with responsibility? Somebody wants to run. <laughs> Most of the time we go, man, I don't need any more responsibility. I just want to just, I just want to be. Responsibility brings blessing. Because what responsibility is, is obedience. It's just another word of saying being obedient to the word. I take the responsibility that the word gives me. What did I do? All I did was I became obedient to what the Word said and forget about all the burden because Jesus said, my burden is easy, and, or my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if his yoke is easy and his burden is light, then responsibility doesn't become a burden or a heavy yoke on us, but instead it becomes something that's, that's easy for us to do because we have a relationship with a Father. And the Lord says, hey, do this, and we do it, and then we get the blessing of doing it. It's exactly what he did to Abraham. Abraham, uh, when he went out and he took care of the kings and the kingdoms that, that the Lord had told him to, what happened? When he come back to the Lord and he gave him a tenth of the spoils, the Lord blessed him. He said, because you were obedient. Because you did what I told you to do. And that's the reason that he blessed Abraham. Uh, the tenth just represented his offering to God. Uh, it wasn't a requirement. See, that it, it, it never, there was no law about giving at that time. So what we realize, it was simply because he wanted to be obedient to God. And God blessed him for the obedience that he got into that place. So we get away from the law. You know, there's a lot of, and, and, and I have... Uh, from time to time we take away the coin and the phrase of the tithe uh, but we don't take it completely away and it's not that we're taught, caught up in the, in the law of tithing we're caught up in the law of giving and giving doesn't mean and it's not a law it's just being obedient to God. And I'm not talking about money right now. I'm talking about giving of whatever it is that God wants us to. Giving of... I'll tell you what happened to me. Um, I asked the Lord... Uh, Kathleen and I... Uh, last uh, last uh, November, I've been in the ministry 35 years, but Kathleen and I have been on the road for... 17 years because we'd been we we started out on the road in 1995 gave up everything um, and it wasn't because I uh, thought that I had to or anything else it was what the Lord told us to do well in that place I had uh, uh, sold five horses to buy Bibles and gasoline to stay on the road well the Lord starts blessing us back with horses when we started raising bucking horses and and, uh, and Tamara's laughing because she's heard Kathleen say this and one time now you think about the law of sowing and reaping the Bible says when you sow in good soil what happens it's a hundredfold return I finally told the Lord I said Lord Kathleen does not want 500 head of horses <laughs> And he laughed at me. He says, I didn't say I was going to give you 500 head of horses. I'm just going to give you back what you gave up and, and give you a hundredfold return on that, which can come in the, in the, in the uh, process of horses, of cattle, of, of money, of, of a lot of different things. And so what we realize the law of sowing and reaping is, and that's what Abraham did. He was just sowing. It wasn't a law of tithing. It, that was what he decided to give. It was, a law, the, it was the principle of sowing and reaping. 
And God blessed him in that. And God will bless you when you sow whatever it is and when you give whatever it is. That simply means sowing just means your, your offerings. I'm, I'm getting, getting in a place and, and, and again, we're not talking about money. That's part of obedience, but we're talking about every other place uh, in, in our lives. And because, uh, let's see, verse 23, also there is many... There were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, who's he? Jesus. Capital H. Because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens." Who does not need daily, somebody says, well, you know, if you're separate from sinners, that just means you didn't hang out with them. That just means that's not who your friends were. Jesus uh, did not separate himself from the, the uh, prostitutes and, the, and the, uh, the, the other people that were highly considered the worst people in the world at that time was tax collectors. And he didn't separate himself from those in the place that he didn't, he didn't, wasn't with them at all. But they weren't his best friends and they, he didn't hang around with them all the time. He hung around with what? His disciples. That was the people that he spent his time with. That's the people that he lived with. That's the people. It's just, and so you don't separate yourself from, from the sinners or those that need to be you can't witness to people that you don't hang around, that, that you're not with. But they don't become the people that you pattern your life after, that you hang around with all the time. That's simply all it's, it's saying here. And has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. And what does it, what, and, and, and that's where we're going to stop tonight. But when you get in, and, and, uh, and we might go on uh, to the next chapter next week, but when we get into, and, and we might not, I'll let, oh no, we won't next week, I'm sorry. Next week's corporate prayer. Um, but what we have to realize is who's our example? Yeah. Man, everybody's quiet tonight. Who's, say it again. He is. Who's he? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is our example. Consider the high priest and the apostle of our confession. What did he do? He set an example of how I'm supposed to live every day. Not because I'm a pastor and not because I'm a minister, but because I belong to him. And that's what each one of us gets in that position where, and I'm going to tell you, sometimes it's really hard to do. If you don't believe me, you're welcome to have my desk for a little while and my telephone. But I know that each one of you has people that you come in contact every day that are like that. That It's real hard to keep your witness in with some of the people we come in contact with. And so what do we have to do? We look at the example of our high priest and our apostle. What did he do? I would imagine that uh, as, as we look at the the Gospels, we realize that there was many times that he took himself aside from his apostles, from his disciples, and all of the people, and he went, and he what? He prayed and spent time with the Lord. Uh, the other day, uh, 
I can't even tell you what was going on. I don't, I, I remembered this morning actually, and I've forgotten it this afternoon because I just spent some time with the Lord. But um, the other day there was some stuff going on that was one of those things that um, my wife says, says uh, let's just put it this way, it didn't make me happy. Okay. And what did I do? I went and spent a couple hours with the Lord, and all of a sudden, I didn't even remember what it was that didn't make me happy. And what we have to do is use that example. When there's people that are pulling on you, that are taking you down, that are making you feel like you're not happy, or on the other hand, you just really want to just punch them in the nose, don't get to that point. Go spend time with the Lord. And then what will happen is, um, I, I have a saying, and, and it's kind of a personal thing, and you'll never know who I say it about. Um, I, I say they can get happy in the same pants they got unhappy in. And the way that works is just let them go spend time with the Lord. I'm not the one that's going to make them happy. I might have been the one that made them unhappy. So what are they going to do? They're going to go spend time with the Lord. We, we, this is the other choice that we make. I believe um, that, and I guess I'm just going to say it. In Parker County, there is, and, and this was five years ago that I got this number. So it might be more now. I don't know. But in Parker County, Five years ago, there was 53 Southern Baptist churches. Burger County ain't that big. The reason that is, is because some people got unhappy, and instead of spending time with the Lord, they said, well, you know, I'm not going to stay here. And they went someplace else and started another one right down the street. And the reason I brought that, that's not about the Southern Baptists, but it's about the choice that we make in life. I either spend time with the Lord or I get so unhappy that I do things that are really stupid and I don't do what I should do. And what I should do is get happy with the Lord and, and forget everything else and not let it bug, bug me. And then what happens is I'm the one that gets blessed because I position myself like Abraham did, to be, be obedient to the Lord. And the apostle and high priest of our faith does what? Blesses me, going and coming. We're not blessed just by what we put in the offering box. We're blessed by our obedience to every area in our life, by the order of an endless high priest who doesn't require sacrifices, doesn't require, he requires my relationship with him. That's all it is. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to uh, be your kids, to live in a place that we can come and worship you. And uh, Father, be, just be your, uh, your voice right here. Father, I pray over each and every one here and each and every one watching by internet that, Father, they will draw closer to you by the example of our apostle and high priest in our confession. That, Father, that by the order that was set up uh, with the example of Melchizedek ending, no ending and no beginning, no genealogy, Father, that you have called us to that kind of priesthood. Uh, Father, and I pray over each and every one that they'll have a revelation of where you want them, how you want them there, and, and what do you want, you want them to accomplish. In the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood, amen. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. 
That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make him the Lord of your life. And as you make him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation... Uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over, to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you, he'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord and Jesus loves you and so do we.